Being in space has always been a cool idea. Ever since humans landed on the moon, exploiting space has been on the forefront of many great minds. The untapped resources above acting like a juicy fruit, mocking us to come up and pick it. If you've ever read the headlines about how mining is destroying the planet and thought, hey, why don't we just take it from somewhere else, then you'd be great at colonialism. But you'd also like Astroneer too. Greetings, and welcome to the first episode of Gaming Perfection, a series I'm starting on YouTube where I take my massive catalog of games and set out to 100% all of them, and in the end I'll answer the question of, what makes the perfect game? Today, we'll be playing Astroneer, a multiplayer open world survival game set in the far reaches of space. As an astronaut, you are the first person to be exploring these distant solar systems, a pioneer of space. To start our celestial journey, I get to pick out my spacesuit and complete the first achievement before we even enter the ship. Now at the drop off point, I separate from the space station and make my landing onto the uninhabited planet of Silva. This will be where it all starts. After reading the instruction manual, after seeing a big block of text, I did what most people would do, and skimmed it, then closed it. This led to me missing some core shortcuts until much later. As a gamer though, I instinctively figured out most of the controls. However, this was not the same for Sevenit, my partner in the program. How do, you, how, do you, how do you open the tutorial again? Did I forget to mention that I would not be alone in this solar system? Having a partner also completes another achievement for the game, so I would need to bring him along. Shortly after my grand entrance to the atmosphere, Sevenit made his way down too. Upon landing though, his ship didn't have a tutorial. With Sevenit not being an experienced astroneer, only Google could save him now. After Sevenit spent some time on Google figuring out the controls, we immediately found out, leaving the vicinity of their drop pod, that we're not the first people to have tried to colonize this planet. Debris of other ships and attempts at building some semblance of a home lay everywhere. Predecessors, as I call them, had left litter over the entire surface of our planet. Apparently space is very dangerous. It makes sense if you think about it. That's why working as a corporation is the only safe way out here. Dying is a normal occurrence and I'm just going to explain respawning by saying we have a clone bay provided by the corporation. Silva, the planet we're on, lacks oxygen. This immediately becomes apparent as the giant blue bar on the back of our bag approaches the end. It's easy to forget that you have to keep breathing to live unless you can't breathe or someone tells you that you are now breathing manually. Sorry. The only way to get back the life giving air was to refill at the space shelter our landing pod had transformed into. Next to the shelter was a corporation provided airdrop platform. Yes, I'm sticking to the we work with a corporation story. If the game won't give me a reason to be here, then I will. By completing corporation tasks, they will airdrop us items that could be useful. Sometimes I swear it's just random junk they found lying around in their warehouse. To start off, they provide us with a small printer used to craft basic items from the planet's resources. They also provide an oxygenator, which makes oxygen. Completing the basic tasks of collecting the corporation's resources also checks off another achievement. These early achievements would be the quickest to get, but later on, it will take much more time to get even one. With the terrain tool in hand, it was now time to start expansion. I guess I forgot to explain what the terrain tool did, since I already knew what it did from watching Green's old Astroneer video when the game was still in alpha. I can't find it now, but I swear it existed. Moving on to the terrain tool, it has the unique power to mine and build. I know I'm just making it sound like Minecraft, so I'll just show you it by gathering some compound off the surface of the planet. The sound of collecting resources gives me the same dopamine rust as leveling up in an MMO. Just listen to it for a sec. Using the compound, tethers can be made to connect oxygen away from the base. Bang! We can go places now. Where do you want to go? Hungry for more resources, I dove into a nearby cave system, grabbing all the materials on site. We found massive sulfide deposits of sulfurite, along with large veins of resin, each one of them having a different collection sound. Mining plants granted organic material, which we used to power generators we made from the compound we got. Medium storage requires two resin. With power in the base now, we used the printer to craft small storages out of resin for all the items we picked up. We also made a large printer for more complex machines. Using some resin, we also built platforms to place our machines and storage on. Using the medium printer, we constructed a research lab to analyze the resources of the planet, getting bytes to unlock new technologies within the process. After putting some of the local flora into the research lab, completing an achievement, we set out to explore. Alright, I'm coming. While in a forest, oh, Seven had spotted an alien shell lying on the ground and scanned it. Seeing him do so, I followed suit, completing two achievements in the process. Only 35 more achievements are left until we become the ultimate space pioneer. Using bias gathered from researching, we can now unlock some new technology. Knowing that generators can only take us so far, I invested in the renewable energy industry, unlocking solar and wind power. However, both required resources we lacked, and I had no clue where we could get them from. We would have to do more exploring first before we could switch over to renewable resources. On the other hand, the smelting furnace 
across our research can be put to use. Ores found in the cave were useless until we refined them in the smeltery. With the smeltery, the sapphirite we found in the cave could be transformed into zinc. Use the craft upgrades to the terrain tool and batteries for the base. Armed with the power of smelting, Seven and I headed back into the cave in search of anything we could shove in the furnace. Staying close to tethers, we found new ore deposits of quartz and laterite. The cave was not void of danger, however, as the local wildlife tried to halt our progress by exploding if we mined near it. As scary as exploding cactuses would be, the plants could be safely detonated at a distance, and they actually helped our progress by netting us our seventh achievement. With our pockets full of mineral magnificence, we headed up from the mines and went to experiment with our new resources. When put in the smelter, quartz would make glass and laterite aluminum. With the acquisition of aluminum, we could now make a soil centrifuge. Collecting soil in the terrain tool and inserting it into the centrifuge, we could refine a whole host of new resources that haven't been seen yet. Using the soil, we could make resin, compound, organics, clay, quartz, graphite, and even ammonia. It goes without saying that this was a powerful machine. For instance, putting clay into the smelter would make ceramic, the resource we were missing to make wind power. It was also another achievement yeah. completed off the list. Utilizing this knowledge, we made several small wind turbines to power the base when the generators are down. Pair this with small batteries made from some zinc, we won't have to feed the generators anymore. Solar, however, evaded us because of the copper required that we couldn't find anywhere. Wind would be our best friend for now, and farther upgrades could be made using aluminum with the ceramic to make an even more powerful wind turbine. To farther our knowledge on what we can make right now, I created the largest printer to see what we could make using it. However, to my dismay, it actually didn't have any recipes unlocked. I probably could have looked ahead on the research tree and saw, but I didn't think that far ahead. While I was so working on the this? base, Seven had witnessed a powerful alien artifact fall from the sky onto an airdrop platform. It came with a set of instructions on how to activate it, recommending we walk away from the base before releasing its power. Upon activating the object, a powerful force could be felt through the air as a fragment of wrecked spaceship was summoned into existence. This could only be ancient alien technology. The ship's fragment wanted power, so we brought it power. Once powered, the ship's computer switched on and allowed us to read the data inside. Too bad most of it was corrupted. Makes sense, since it's a ship fragment, not a ship. It seems to be a research ship called the Triton that was carrying rare organisms called gastropods until it met its divine. Before the ship crashed, the researcher in charge of the gastropods ejected them, leaving behind data on how to find the creatures and care for them. In Gamerspeak, this was a quest that we would do later after acquiring resources needed in it. I also need to mention how spooky the music of the ship was. I have no clue if it was meant to scare me, but it made me see an alternate world where Ashtonir could have been a horror game. Nah, that doesn't sound good. Seven and went back out exploring and found another weird alien artifact just lying around. I found a cool item. I don't know what it does though. He's some kind of supernatural magnet. He showed it to me, warning me of its dangers. It looks really dangerous though. So I did the natural what? thing and immediately after seeing it, activated it. The sky whirled in a fracture of colors. A stained glass window shattered for all to see. Asteroids whizzing ahead, inches away from being pulled down and ending all life on the planet. Then, nothing else happened. A spooky noise played and it said, world stability has fallen, but mechanically nothing changed. Really thought I just about killed all of us, but instead I got us a new cool backdrop. Soundtrack to a minor too. On another note, Seven and also found a horn. Oh, I also got this, ready? <laughs> you got a horn? Yeah, I got a horn. <laughs> so obnoxious. We threw both in our storage. Under our new shattered sky, we went back to work. Seven at exploring and I expanding. While I was in the mines, Seven at read the logs of the ship, figuring out filling a terrarium with some soil, growing a plant in it, and putting a horn on it created music that would lure out one of the gastropods from the ground. The gastropod sang along with a song as Seven had danced to his tunes. Wait, did you see this? See what? Holy shit, I have a pet! Hi friend! Wait, does it want me to dance? Let's go man, I'll emote for you. Dude, I'm just doing a chicken dance for this thing. Yo, what the heck? Once he danced enough to the gastropod, no, I'm just gonna call it a snail now, because it looks like one and that's easier to say. Once he had danced enough to the snail, it crawled its way back into the terrarium, Kidnapped him! And now we could scan it to complete the first part of the quest line. You see what's happening? Did you unlock it with the terrarium? I oh, did! No, I have a best friend in there! 
You beamed him in there. What had I been doing while Sevenit was playing with the snail? Well, through my exploration of the research tree, we now had a tractor with several trailers in tow, completing an achievement for myself. I made a car. Wait, we have a car? With the corporation airdropping a highly advanced QRTG for who knows what mission, our car could now travel anywhere without needing to refuel. The car also doubled as a portable oxygen source, removing the need to tether ourselves. I'm gonna stop here for a second and give a quick explanation of what an RTG is because they are really cool. An RTG, or radioscopic thermic generator, uses the power of decaying radioactive material like plutonium-238 to make a long-lasting power source. It's actually a real thing used by scientific devices like satellites or volcano monitors that are too dangerous or far away to recharge. Look them up if you want to see more because I think they're just really cool. Let's get roll one, baby. Back in Astroneer, we set out on an expedition around the world using our new tractor. Old research data from the predecessors were locked in storage modules, and powering them would open up it, netting us a good chunk of bites. In the distance, alien structures could be spotted towering over any mountains in the horizon. Getting close to one of these colossal constructions unveiled their true nature, a form of ancient gateway, and another achievement. How to activate these gateways, however, still eluded us, so returning would be something we would need to do in the future, as several achievements in the game were tied to them. On the other hand, the presence of the alien tech seemed to have other weird effects on the surrounding, or at least, that's the only way I can explain this next clip. Nearby physics seemed to act unusual. I'm sure this was an intended feature of the game, definitely not a bug in any way. Help me! <laughs> Where do you go? Help me! Help! Wait, 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 wait. I'm in interplanetary orbit! <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> After recovering from the blunt force trauma I picked up, Seven and I headed back oh, to the base no, to continue down the tech tree. <gasps> what? Oh! I was looking the wrong way! Oh, I see- oh, oh. Uh, come oh. on, you got the torque! Uh, uh, uh. Oh, there we go. Back at base, I dabbled in Ash Janeer's automation a little, by building a dirt to small storage machine. And I was happy with the results. Bulk item processing was now hit at an all time high throughput rate. The power of machines is amazing. I'll never get tired of automating resources in video games. Yep, I'm a Look factorial prayer. And yes, I will go fully into Ash Janeer's automation system. This game and some of its farms are gonna be wild. At this point, morale was high and projections only showed exponential growth. We also discovered Malachite ore in the mountains, the ore used to refine copper and make solar. This is where progression slows in the game, however. The next step in progression required tungsten, which would require wool for my ore. Tungsten is needed to make a chemistry lab that's used to cook up all sorts of valuable goods, like every alloy or mix in the game. The problem comes because wool for is not on Sylvie. In fact, all tech at this point required an ore that that's not located on Silva, like lithium for better batteries or iron for steel. The only option left was to create a space program and launch ourselves off the confines of this planet. Every planet has its own achievement too, so our space program would serve a double purpose. It would not be easy though. Our first steps in the space program was to make a shuttle. Then we would fit it with an oxygenator for oxygen and secure a solid fuel thruster made of ammonium to the bottom. With the current technology we had, we would only have the fuel to fly to a planet and back. There was also no room in the rocket to bring anything along, only being able to fit what we could fit on our back. Want to smelt some ore? Well, remember everything we did to get up to smelting in the first place? We got to do it all again now. There was no other option I knew of though, so I set out to Novus, the forest planet, to gather lithium while Seven In headed to Kalidor, the desert planet, to gather Wolfamite. Enter. I Launch wait. to another planet? Oh, sh**. Uh -huh. Oh, I actually went to Atriox. Fuck. Which one does resources Atriox have? Very hazardous. I follow that. Well, we have to set up a base here eventually anyways, right? It doesn't have lithium or tungsten. What does it have? Nothing. Launch to another planet. 
However, we had, let's just say, different levels of success. I took the shelter we got from the corporation, leaving Seven Inch struggling how to figure out how to plug in his machines, since the shuttle didn't come along with a power plug. Without power, he didn't know how to print platforms to put power producers on. Little did he know, generators he had in his power suit could have just been dropped on the ground to power his printer. Not a pro astroneer move. On Novus, I had dug us a deep tunnel underground, and after fighting off the hostile plants, found the plant's signature lithium vein. Found lithium. Nice. The path to medium batteries was right ahead of us, only delayed by me getting lost. I got lost in these caves. Dying. Wait, where's the tether? GG. And having to use the clone bay to retrieve the items, only to lose the entrance again. Hey. I never claimed to be a pro astroneer either. After following my tethers for a while, I eventually found the entrance again and slid back down, sliding straight into the next achievement. Oh my gosh, I'm picking up so much speed. Looting my old body, I was able to take the lithium back with me and get out of the cave. On my way out, I tested an explosive I found lying around to open one of the predecessor storage caches. Inside, I found us a highly advanced computer component called exochips that surprisingly didn't get blown up by the explosives. With no way I knew how to make something like this myself, finding these components would help create more complex machines once we have the required ores. I had built a base on Novus to aid in extracting lithium, but was limited by the lack of zinc, preventing me from building batteries. Because of that, the base on Sylvie would stay the main one. Using the base, I made a tractor to bring down into the mines. Driving a car would provide me with portable oxygen and providing it with a QRTG also provided infinite power too. The only downside to the cave car is caves are not the ideal space to drive a car in. With a little, okay, maybe a lot of flattening with the terrain tool, I built a path that could be driven going into the cave. I just hope the car's suspension would be able to deal with the stalagmites growing from the ground. Maybe the tires are made of nitinol plus and that's why they can drive straight over basically a bed of nails. Using the tractor to gather resources underground no longer held the risk of awakening in the clone bay again. It also lets me gather as much lithium as we could possibly need and bring it straight up to the ship. With my pockets full of lithium, I made my way back up into the shuttle and headed back to Sylvia. Goodbye. I came into the planet's orbit and landed on the first landing pad I saw. However, in my negligence, it turned out to have been a wasted landing platform made by the predecessors in the middle of nowhere. Oh my gosh, I landed on the wrong airport. Stranded and out of fuel on the other side of the planet from the base, I had no choice but to wait for Seven Int to come and bail me out. Thank you, Seven Int. I take back all the bad things I said about you not being a pro astroneer. And if you're watching this video, <laughs> thanks for the lift. After returning to the base, I used the lithium to upgrade the base with better batteries capable of storing 16 times more power. We also got an airdrop from the corporation providing us with a large wind and large solar system. Ooh, really making this a huge power upgrade. After a futile attempt at flattening the base, uh, we lost our buggy. <laughs> it quite literally just clipped through the floor. I used the wolframite that Sevenet had brought back from Kalidor to make tungsten and construct the chemistry lab. After getting everything prepared, we now had all we needed to start making alloys. Copper and aluminum were combined to make aluminum alloy, reserving the chemistry achievement. With the aluminum alloy, we can now make an upgraded shuttle which has storage slots on it, so we can actually bring items with us when we move between planets. Bam, medium shuttle. However, this was not the end of the fun, because there was still much more that could be done with the new chemistry lab. Combining compound and carbon, which is just smelted organics, we can make plastic, and using plastic with glass makes medium soil canisters. There are a huge upgrade to soil capacity when mining the vehicles, the best form of mining. Soil was also still being used to make the basic resources we needed, so more soil was amazing. But wait! There's more! Using the same recipe, you can also make medium resource canisters. Now this is where the storage is at. The storage you were using before only had 8 items that it could store. Well, medium storages can hold up to 33 items of the same type. Combine this with our new shuttles that now have storage slots, and bringing backpacks worth of resources between planets just looks like jump change. We would be putting this technology to use because there's another roadblock ahead. Steel, titanium, and iron. These were all resources needed in the next step of progression staircase, and they were all found on another planet. Thankfully, 
Finally, I was able to find the planet that had them all, Glacio. The ice-covered wasteland was the perfect planet to gather the resources we need, as it had both titanite and hemonite ore, used in titanium and iron respectively. It also had the perfect atmosphere, as argon was needed in the production of steel, only found elsewhere on Vanessa, but Vanessa didn't have hemonite for steel. It was the perfect planet, leaving only one thing left to do, pack up and fly over there to start building. You want to hear what I got? I got a resource container with 32 resin in it. I got a medium battery, a fluid and soil canister, a um, medium resource canister, solid fuel thruster, medium printer, small printer, and solar panel. Hello. Alright, I'm stealing a single wind turbine. Being able to unload items from the ship gave us a huge head start in building a mining base. I set up a small printer and started laying down the foundations for the operational base. The wind on Glacio was insane, made up for by its trash solar. This meant that the few wind turbines I was able to find scattered around would be the very overpowered power production of this base. With the outhouse coming along, I had the time to start looking for hemonite and titanite veins, but Glacio would not cease to be amazing. The hemonite needed to manufacture iron was just lying everywhere on the surface, just asking to be taken away and upgraded into fantastic steel. However, this is where my lack of foresight started to become a problem. In order to get a furnace down, I would need compound. And since every planet just had compound lying around on the surface, I assumed it would be just as easy to get on Glacio, so I didn't bring any with me. The thing is, I landed between two massive icebergs and there was no compound visible near me. In order to explore out, I would need compound to craft tethers, but I only brought a single set of them. Stuck, and with seemingly no other option but to turn back, my creative brain kicked into motion. The shuttle would provide me with a small amount of power and oxygen when I was nearby so that I wouldn't die when landing on a new planet. The shuttle could also be moved, but when moving it, I could not move myself. You could stop, move the shuttle forward, then walk a bit and repeat, but I had thought of my own method that would be a much better portable oxygen system. If you were sliding or jumping, then picking up the item would not affect your movement speed since you were already in the air and it only affected your base walking speed. That meant that picking up the shuttle and dragging it forward in a mid jump would make it so that you would not slow down at all, making it a super fast oxygen source. With the shuttle in tow, I was able to scour the surface of Glacio, finding a patch of compound. Oh, what is this I spy up here? A little bit of compound I see and bringing it back to my base. I was then able to craft a smelter and soil centrifuge with it. With a centrifuge, I could make more compound out of soil whenever I needed it. I was also able to use the compound to craft more tethers for oxygen while boring a tunnel deep into the ground in search of the final resource on Glacio I needed, Titanite. As I went down, though, I found out the hard truth, the ground. It was way too hard for my excavation tool, forcing me to look back through the research tree and find what I had missed. It's just buzzing at me. What research did we miss? After finding an item called a drill and fitting it to the end of my tool, I was now able to mine the hard rock in the cave. I then collected some aluminum to construct a tractor and brought it down into the mines, ready to fill it up with titanite. After maxing out my storage in titanite, I then headed back up and set up a huge batch of titanium. This also netted me the achievement of smelting every ore in the game. With a ship full of iron and titanium, I headed back to Silva. With two of the three resources I set out to get, technological upgrades were now possible. Using titanium, Medium storage silos were now able to be printed, capable of holding three times what the small storage silo was able to hold, and without the downside of the medium storage being only able to hold one item type. It also had some physics-defying properties, fitting into places it really shouldn't have been able to fit. It was way too long to fit in my rocket. Using this huge upgrade brought by the storage silo, I filled up my rocket with a supply drop for Sevenant and items needed for steel back on Glacio. I then headed over to Sevenant's planet of Kalidor, getting more planet achievements in the process. Greetings, my bud. Welcome. Sevenant had done a lot on Kalidor in the time that he had been gone, extracting a massive amount of tungsten. He also built his own semi-auto sorting and smelting system to assist in unloading his mining truck. The mega item drop that I brought him would help in expanding his tungsten mining operations to new levels. Off to Glacio, I had all the resources needed to make a large batch of steel, the final of the items needed to reach high level tech. However, the single ingot of tungsten I could have sworn I brought needed to make the chemistry lab was missing from the ship. Either I forgot to put it or Sevenant's auto arm stole it. I don't know which. Oh, goodness for you. You get to visit me again, and you get to take this stupid fucking container full of 32 tanks. I don't actually need it right now. I still needed to go all the way back to Kalidor after making a new rocket booster just to grab some tungsten and fly back after. Come into your world. I needed one tungsten. 
Back on Glacio, I used the centrifuge to craft the carbon needed for steel, pulling the argon out of the atmosphere with the atmospheric condenser as well. Oh my gosh, the atmospheric condenser draws power. Holy cow, it draws power. I built a lab and put all the resources together with a dash of iron and the recipe was complete. We now had the ability to craft bulk amounts of steel. And I ran out of power for- I took full advantage of this to fill this ship up heading back to Silva richer ever than before. Collecting gas also completed another one of the achievements needed for 100%ing the game. With the power of the new big three resources that I just got, no technology was now out of grasp. Unless, of course, it required more bites or gas, but it was still most of the items in the game. I started off the great crafting spree with an auto extractor, an item capable of automatically gathering resources at 15 times what the excavation tool could. However, I didn't know that at the time, and had to read the Astropedia to try and get an idea on how to use it. Once I had learned of its potential, Seven and I set out to mark as many resources as possible located all over Silva. With all our resources marked, finding whatever we would need at the time and putting an auto extractor there would be an easy task. In order to make the beacons, we went crazy lengths, mining the resources of the entire forest behind us just for dirt to make more quartz. Seven it was also able to receive another airdrop in that time that we spent at her base. It contained another alien artifact that can only be opened on Glacio, as well as a scrapper that allowed us to scrap items we found lying around, completing another achievement. Scrap could be gained from scrapping items and traded for almost any resource in the entire game. If this sounds OP to you, then you would be right, and much later on, I would figure it out as well. And we would be abusing how OP scrap was. Back on the tech side of things, I had to run a very tedious power extender to an auto extractor that I set up on an aluminum vein. I brought a resource canister over to it, and the first automatic mining setup on Silva was completed. I then placed another auto miner on an ammonium vein nearby. I also attached an atmospheric condenser to the base to gather some hydrogen. Getting these two resources allowed us to craft hydrazine. With hydrazine, we could fuel the way better hydrazine thrusters capable of launching our rocket 24 times versus the abysmal two times the solid rocket engines we were using before could. Just to have fun with our newfound power, I flew to all the planets we had been to before, collecting any extra items lying on the ground and dropping them off back at Silva. Utilizing all the extra resources I got from collecting the stuff on the other planets, I made an extra large wind turbine. This also utilized the hydrazine that we were now able to make, making graphene with it. When we pitched it up, we now were able to top off the power to the base, letting us add new auto miners to it, so we can extract all types of resources now. Wait, oh, because I didn't click deploy. Holy cow, it's going! After realizing the power of rails, I was able to use them like power poles to connect all the auto miners together, instead of having to use the terribly tedious power extenders that I was using before. The rails could reach much farther than the power extenders and automatically connect it instead of me having to drag them all together. This allowed me to reach the copper up in the mountains with an auto extractor, so now even copper was being automated. Utilizing the surplus and resources we now had, I made my way over to Glacio to start auto mining, titanite, and hemonite, since steel was needed in the construction of the auto miners. I brought the ingredients to get down two XL windmills and the train tracks for bringing the power to each resource extractor. Everything went mostly to plan. Other than the fact that I found all my old items and the tractor that I had clipped through the floor into the cave below. Oh, oh! I thought this was my rover. Wait, is this my rover? It is my rover. And my solid fuel thruster. <laughs> they all clipped through the ground and it came into this cave, <laughs> including. Look at. <laughs> oh, I didn't steal it. I am not a criminal. I thought I accidentally stole your stuff. Time and time again, Astroneer loves to show off how great its physics are. With the train tracks in place, you can now ride a train and pick up all the resources you would need on Glacio until the auto miners ran out, but that would be in a long time. I even experimented with having the trains automatically collect the resources and bring them up to smelt all on their own, but I quickly found out that this would be a huge waste of time, considering the auto miners didn't last forever. While I had been setting up the entire planet of Glacio, Sevenant had been doing something on Silva. The war stocks in the game, placing down power extenders by hand. This was a thing to be avoided at all cost due to the terrible tedium they induced on anyone who attempt to use them. Sevenant had been connecting the transferring power lines of rails together with power extenders for over half an hour, completely misunderstanding how they work. What are you doing right now, Sevenant? Uh, doing. Wait, no, no. What? 
Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry you've been doing this. The rails connect power automatically. You see the giant glowing yellow thing in there? But, no. So you draw power out of them. Here, go down later on and try to plug in a machine. You'd be able to plug in a machine to that post. No! 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 no. <laughs> Seven and no! no. Oh. Dude, what have you done? Hey, it's your boy. Can I play Valorant? Oh my god. <laughs> I feel so bad. Uh, I'm really cold right now. I think I'm sick too. Because I am in a like a cold sweat. So wait, so wait, I started my screen share like 15 minutes ago or some shit. I was watching uh how to set up rails. How long were you doing that for? Well, if, uh, here's the thing though. I died from lack of oxygen. So I thought it didn't like pull power. I was very confused. No, it does, but only you can only get oxygen next to the poles. You can't get it from the rail itself. Yeah, I think that's enough oxygen here for me. <laughs> How many of those have you placed down? It just, it just walk down the line and you'll see. It's so much. It's so much. It's, it's. Did you not see all my other rails that I hooked up the auto miners to? No, that I don't didn't. Do that's that? the thing. Yeah, no, I didn't see that. No. Oh no! It keeps going. It there's like twenty something. No, there's like no twenty. Yeah, 20 uh, tall poles. Oh no! Each, each one of those oh. have four. So 20 times four. I had 80. No. Tired. I'm cold. I'm. I think I'm sick too. This isn't. I am reporting Astroneer for war crimes. Cause that's what that is. That's a. That is. That is a war crime. So that. That is a. That's criminal behavior. That is just so heartbreaking to look at. Oh, how long was I was I thought I was doing that for like an hour. Fuck. Now for this next little bit of recording, I forgot to record, but Sevenit was able to save the day with his POV. In order to craft the rarest endgame alloy in the game and get infinite oxygen, we crafted a large shuttle and headed over to Atriox. Atriox is the most dangerous planet in the entire solar system, but also the only planet with the gas we needed. We went there to gather the helium needed to forge nanocarbon alloy. The trip went swimmingly as we trekked up to the North Pole and raised our base on top of the teleporter located there. Things only took a slight turn for the worse when I had forgotten a critical resource, like always, and had to take a rock it to get it after leaving seven it stranded without oxygen it was a very close call and he barely survived after i came running back with the rocket just making it on time we made it out with the helium and got the nanocarbon alloy needed to craft our portable oxygenators combine this with the qrtg generators and infinite oxygen has been acquired while i was celebrating our achievement seven it flew back to atrox to grab something he had left behind what he had left behind though didn't matter because he had taken the large shuttle with him and instead of doing the logical thing of walking on the same path we did every time we landed Ended, he decided to walk his own path. Now, there is a reason that Atriox is the most dangerous planet in a game without monsters, and that's because of plants. While other planets have plants that explode when mined or just shoot acid at you, Atriox is different. It has planets that just straight up shoot missiles at you. When we had originally walked north, we had taken care of all of the crazy RPG plants before they became a problem, but we hadn't walked where Sevenant is heading now. Without thinking, Sevenant walked right into one of these crazy plants, and using his two left feet, he got himself and the large shuttle blown smithereens by the rpg carrying plant <sighs> that was it that was the end of our large shuttle but it would still not be the end of atriox reign of terror adrian block adrian block adrian block yeah did you die adrian block sorry go to the fire base right now hey so you know when we first spawned go there yes go there really quickly what how adrian block want to know something even worse no do you know our ship? Um, yeah, and it uh it blew up. <laughs> it, 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 it it uh blew up. What happened? So apparently, I didn't know this. There is a firework hazard on that planet. Why didn't you land in the right location? Then how did you die? You want to go back on the video for me with me? Do your book. I'm sorry. Here, I'll, I'll screen share this thing right here. That shoots rockets at you. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I dodged it here. I dodged it here again. I thought I dodged it here, but I it, it blew up rocket and it killed me in the process. I didn't know it could blow up. I am so incredibly sorry. That thing costs two exo chips. Do you know how expensive that is? That ship was super expensive. I'm so sorry. Yep, the entire thing is 
exploded. Yeah, I guess I guess this this is coming out of the graveyard now. Oh my gosh. I'm sorry, it was an accident. I am so sorry. Oh my god. I'm li I'm crying right now. I'm I legit have tears in my eyes. I'm so sorry. Think about it this way. I did it for the bit, you know. You don't even have we don't even have more exo chips, so we can't even in order to head back and get Seven and stuff, I manned a ship back to Atriox with Seven in tow. He got out to get his stuff. However, when we tried to leave, Fate had other plans. Turns out, Seven had blown up the rest of our fuel, and the shuttle we took only had enough to take us to Atriox, meaning now we had no fuel to leave the planet. Alright, we only have enough fuel to make it back. This could go really, really bad. The only way to leave now would be to craft a solid rocket engine. Thankfully, we had built a little bit of a base when we set up our helium collecting system. So, all we had to do was start crafting. We were able to find all the resources needed to craft one, but I also learned of a thing I'd like to try called core surfing. Since no one likes Atriox, I thought in order to get some revenge on the planet, we could participate in some core surfing, stripping a hole all the way to the center of the planet. After getting Seven out on board, it was time to get our revenge for the death of the large shuttle. Here we go! I trust you. Core surfing was fast, but the closer we got to the core, the harder it became to keep going down. Like trying to fire something into the sun, it was harder than you thought it would be. We had to constantly keep readjusting it just to keep us on course in order for our dive to reach the bottom. But once we started heading down, we got two achievements just for making it so far. Journey to the center of a thing. Travel to the center of any planet in a multiplayer game. Now, here in the caverns above the core, there was a wealth of bites to be found. A thousand bites?! A thousand bites! Enough for us to get more than 30k bites. But the mysterious purple light shining in the cave attracted more attention. A thousand bites. Oh, there's purple light behind us as well. Like the moths we are, Seven and I were drawn to the amethyst glow. Digging down on the beacon revealed its source to be a pillar of alien machine technology filling the core of the world. The gravity manipulation present at the site suggested that the whole planet existed due to this technology. Inside the core were four weird pedestals with symbols on them. I kind of recognized them, but I couldn't remember where they were from. Everything just seemed to be one big puzzle left behind by the aliens to solve. With no way to finish the challenge, we headed back up. After figuring out which way was up... Do I just go straight up? Which one was the pillar up? We're gonna have to find... It's gonna be the opposite of one of this one then. So the opposite one would be this way man i ain't know no mathematics i'm just running up the pillars ah! <laughs> i'm here and we flew back to silva once back there there was another shortage of exochips something happened to the previous thing we spent our exochips on it, it was it was me, but like extra chips were needed in the advanced recipes of endgame machines, and I still hadn't found another way of acquiring them other than finding the rare exo caches scattered all over the planet and blowing them up. Sometimes though, they were really hard to find since I didn't know they would show up on the compass. Sevenant knew that the entire time though, and didn't think to share it with me until I had almost beaten the game. So after Sevenant magically found a bunch of exo crates, we had the exo chips we needed. We had exochips, resources, and we're doing great. But this is where it all goes straight off of a cliff. The next time we were playing, I was tired and died. If you die before getting your stuff back in Ashtonir, the bag despawns, clipping all of your items into random caves. I died completely lost trying to find my backpack. I just wanted to restart the day after that. But Ashtonir saves all the time. Anytime you enter a vehicle, a shelter, or even a rock. It also saves when you exit the game. The constant saving makes it insufferable when playing in multiplayer, and someone is just driving a car around collecting items, as it lags the game every time it saves. Thankfully though, I had died right after the start of the day, and no one had entered any vehicles. It would be easy to go back, right? That's where Ashtonir's crazy saving takes it to the next level. Even if you alt F4 that puppy, it still saves. I only learned later that you have to close it with Task Manager in order to stop it from saving. I should have just accepted it as punishment for trying to revert, but that's where I made another mistake. Looking to see if, because of all of the saving, there would be a save manager, I checked the menu and clicked on Creative Mode. That was the end of the world. Clicking Creative Mode once in Ashtonir will permanently disable a achievements for the world. Remember how I said I didn't know alt f 4 would still save? Well, let's just say that I would remember it now. Oh my freaking gosh, this server file is bugged now. We can't get achievements on it. <sighs> so glad that happened just because I clicked a single button in the menu. That was it.
That was the end of the world. 100% would be impossible now. I thought of ending it all here. I could complete the game, but it wouldn't count. All that time would be put to waste. This entire script would be put to waste. But I'll stop dragging it out, because you already know by seeing the time left in the video, I didn't end it here. The world may now be dead, but the experiences and knowledge I had learned up to this point would not. I would do it all again like a regressor. I would do everything, but better. I had done my research this time, and I was confident I could get everything we had before in way less time. Upon starting a new world and returning, there was so much to do right away. To start, compound, resin, and some sapphirite would be needed along with some bites. We would use the bites to get down some basic resource processing and turn out loads of zinc. With zinc, you can make machines to automatically analyze the terrain for you and bring in an infinite amount of bites. All the time we had spent gathering bites previously would now be cut out. After setting up our bots around the planet, we packed up the base and headed to the South Pole for another trick to be used. At either the North or the South Pole, any solar panels placed upside down will see the sun 100% of the time effectively acting like an RTG, giving consistent power. Power could be expanded without having to worry about the limits of battery input and output rates, giving the entire reliance on lithium. However, there was an even more crucial reason for building the base at one of the poles that made it a must. Due to the way the planets generated an astroneer, truly flat surfaces could only be made at one of the teleporters around the map. The poles were the only place on the entire planet you could use both of these tricks at once, making them way more ideal places for a base than on our previous world. With the location set and all the crucial items moved there, construction on the main base could commence. The base would be built under the southern teleporter, a massive cavern along the entire surface of the planet, till the plane stretched off the curvature of the planet itself. Digging up this much earth would also net us a ton of soil. The soil would be used to make all of the resources needed to construct the base, and it was the main ingredient in our rags to riches scheme that would make every Every resource we would ever need in the entire game. Once the plan was in motion and the richest machine built, mining resources would never be needed again. All that was needed were a couple of the special resources found off planet that a quick shuttle trip would suffice for. After the shuttle trip, we printed off some medium soil canisters and went to work excavating the mega base. Once the hole was of sufficient size to drop our equipment into, we started work on the great plan. After picking up two exochips, an exotrade platform, and a scrapper were made. With the soil centrifuge, resin would be made that would be printed into small resource canisters that would be crushed down into scrap. Remember when I said scrap could be traded for any resource in the game? Well, now it was time to abuse how overpowered it was. This process could effectively make any ore out of soil alone. I used the richest machine to gather a boatload of titanium to flesh out the base with better storage towers. I used the storage towers to bolt, collect, and smelt batches of resources. A batch of zinc was made for even more bite farm. I also made a batch of organic for carbon, compound to combine into plastic, and one batch of quartz for glass, giving me a ridiculous amount of medium resource canisters to store all of the items we were getting. All of this though, still required a boatload of soil to be mined. So, as I collected resources, the base expanded to ridiculous sizes. The platform expanded until it went over the curvature of the planet on one side, and you could see the sky through the gap. In order to speed up the large trips and make make a start on the best soil gathering method in the game, I researched and crafted the items needed for a large rover. All it took was an aluminum alloy, a rubber, which was just organic and resin, and two exochips. This was the biggest vehicle in the game. If tractors were golf carts, then this would be a semi. In order to make it into a soil mining machine, though, I would have to kit it out with a drill and a paver. The drill was something I could work towards right now, as the only thing missing for the diamond it needed was some hydrogen. Hydrogen would also allow me to make hydrazine, the catch-all fuel for the rocket travel in the game. Now, 
you may be thinking, why do you have to go to other planets if you can get all of the ores with the richest machine on Silva? That would be a good question if gases didn't exist. Each planet has its own atmosphere of gases that can still only be collected on another planet with an atmospheric condenser. For now though, I'd focus on preparing all the resources I would need to set up gas collection facility on Glacio and Atriox. The two planets plus Sylvie having all of the gases in the entire game. I tried to use only the drill to collect some dirt with the rover, but not knowing how to control the up and down, I drove straight into a cave. With the paver, the rover would use extra soil to build a path below it, making falling into caves no longer a risk. The only reason we didn't have a paver yet is because it requires silicone, one of the resources needing off-planet gases. Silicone was not the only item blocking technological progress right now, as steel needed argon from Glacio, nanocarbon alloy needed helium from Atriox, and other similar alloys like explosive powder needed in, while explosives needing sulfur from off-planet. I had a plan though to get all of the gases we would need. I would make a huge amount of malachite and smelt it into copper. With the copper, I would fill up an entire storage tower with small solar panels. I would also print out a bunch of tiny platforms and bring some resin with us. I would then pack the resources needed for us to get down an atmospheric condenser and fly the to the planet's southern pole. Once on the planet, it would be like assembling IKEA furniture. Slap down the power pole, connect the platforms, make the medium platform, fix up the atmospheric condenser after printing it, then wait for it to print all of the gas you would need at a time. Easy, right? With the Glacio gas facility up and running, we made it back to base with our pockets full of argon. To get the resources for Atriox gas collection project, I had to go back to the mines farming up soil, making the base absolutely massive now. I made up another power pole and then landed on Atriox surface, ready to brave the crazy RPG plants and make it to the southern pole. Surprisingly though, everything went just as planned, making it off the planet with a full stake of methane and helium, giving us access to all the late game alloys right now. It was now time to craft. With methane in hand, I made the silicone needed for the paver. Our soil collecting rover was now complete. Since I still didn't know how to control up and down for the rover though, I collected all the soil by digging straight down into the ground, making some kind of weird cave. The silicone I made could also be used to make gas canisters, making collecting gas in the future take way less flights. Flights were also cheaper now with the hydrazine thruster back, powering the rocket. With helium and argon acquired, I can now make nanocarbon alloy, the resource needed in the portable oxygenator. We had now made it back to our former riches of the previous world, but we had so much more room to grow. We had a mega true flat base, infinite solar, the richest machine, and even a large rover to maximize soil collection. Speaking of the large rover, I now used its power to take a massive massive tunnel down to the core of the planet, giving me an achievement for mining hard rock with its drill. There was a resource down there that would supercharge the base into its final evolution, but for now, I would have to craft the resources needed to start collecting it. I made our first auto extractor of this world and also crafted some RTG, the more powerful cousin of the QRTG, able to make more use of power continuously, no matter where it was. They were rather expensive though, requiring a nanocarbon alloy and lithium, the most expensive ore from the richest machine. So, solar would still be cheaper for anything close to the sun. One RTG on the rover provided infinite power, and two more would power the auto extractor in the floor. The only thing left were some resource canisters and an auto arm to collect the items into the canisters. I drove down to the core and set it all up, but what was the resource I was so hyped about only being found deep underground? Couldn't all ores be made in the riches machine now? Well, this was no ore we were collecting from the core. It was a trading resource. Astronium could do almost anything, able to get huge amount of exochips without having to go find the caches and blow them up. It could also make the most powerful scrap farm in the entire game, making three scrap to one astronium. For comparison, one soil canister would make one scrap and had to be mined for 5.5 seconds manually. Astronium could be mined automatically though. After letting the miner fill up my storages and placing them on my rover, I struggled to make my way back up, still not figuring out how to mine upwards, and losing our tunnel back up. I think this is becoming a common theme now. I had to tilt the rover with the terrain gun and mine up the whole way back, taking a little over half an hour. I will never do that again. Once back at base, I decided it was time to upgrade our soil to scrap farm.
Using extra large platform C's, three soil centrifuges could be fit onto one platform. Auto arms would be used to remove the resin and place them onto another extra large storage platform with six printers. A problem with the previous farm was that printers would print the soil canisters too fast and end up spilling them all over the ground, forcing me to come over and clean it up. With auto arms moving them, the printers could only print as fast as the auto arms could remove things, fixing the problem. The small printers put the soil canisters on a small storage that an auto arm would grab from and then feed into an extra large scrapper. At the end of this, two auto arms would take out the scrap and fill up an extra large resource canister that I had made with the extra nanocarbon alloy we had lying around. In total, this was a 3x increase to the previous soil farm, and it fixed all the problems the other one had. Time to turn on the scrap farm, see how this works. Let's do this. To match the 3x increase, I also made a storage silo full of soil canisters, able to hold 3x what the previous storage could hold in soil. I also made a 3 times faster trading platform for scrap, effectively making any ore in the game 3 times faster to gather. If you think this is the fastest we are going to gather scrap, or the most complex machine we are going to build, I dare you to stick around to the end and see what I end up making. For now, Seven had returned, and it was time to do some achievement. We printed out another large rover to attach as a trailer, and set out onto the alien teleporter gates. The observant of you may have noticed that the teleporters had a power outlet on them, the same type as their platform. With the rover's batteries and an RTG on it, then plugging them into the teleporters with just enough power to fully charge them, causing a spectacle of light. <laughs> I had to, I had to. There was not just one teleporter on the planet though, there were six, so we set out to turn them all on. Our final bar, oh my gosh, it's exactly, exactly enough. Oh, hi. We just have to activate the other teleporters now. <laughs> huh? It's down under here, bro. The teleporter's underground. Oh. <laughs> oh, so that's the center. I want to get on top of it though. Yeah, I'm the king of the world. Uh, this is it. The final teleporter. We're discovering the alien technology left before. The entire planet's good to play. <laughs> We're moonwalking. That was anticlimactic. Yes. We have one more. With all the teleporters lit, you can now check at the orb at the center of them and see the monoliths were all glowing except for the core. Determined to light up everything, we drove the rover into the core, learning the hard way that rovers were not designed to be driven there, as we were sent flying out of bounds. Ah! Oh, this yeah, is so we, weird. We definitely cry, though. This is so weird. The trailer is being really weird. Ah! Oh, the core's open. Can I get in though? Nope, I'm floating. I have no control where we are going right now. Okay, Trevor, what? Just, just... Ah! What are you doing? <laughs> I'm clipped. Is Let me in there. Out of tech. <laughs> Try driving this. Get us in the hole. Oh. I, I clipped through the map. Help. Bye-bye. <laughs> Seven, do you see me? I'm in the core of the core. In the vertices. You lost our trailer. I didn't lose the trailer. Excuse me. All right. I was wrong. You're right. This is fucking impossible. Get back over here, Seminid. I don't know where you are. You can, How can you not see me? <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? What? Seminid, what are you doing? I'm doing a kickflip, leave me alone! <laughs> uh, I'm ramming it. Try going really, really, really slow. Just tap it and try to fall down the hole. Here, I'll push you. I'll push you from behind. Go. Oh, you made it in! No, you went too yeah. fast, Seven It! You didn't listen to me! No, Seven It! Seven It! I'm going around. Give me a minute. Give me control, Seven It. See, 
Ah, no! It's so close! Yeah, yeah, Let me yeah. in! See? <laughs> hey, it was that easy. Oh, oh no. Oh, okay, I came out from the bottom of the map. Where am I? Where am I? I'm underneath. Trailerlock. Trailerlock. Trailerlock, help me. I'm inside the cube. Uh, can I put it in now? Power. Wait, what? Did we not have to bring this in here? It needs a resource. So you're saying we did all that order? <laughs> There wasn't even a power outlet in the core. Stuck on what to do? I checked the wick. <clears throat> I mean, I looked at the symbols on the pedestal in the core and I found out that they matched the ore quartz. I'm good at puzzles. After a quick mining trip, we put the quartz in the core and watched it come to life. Holy sh! that was so cool. The quartz formed a mysterious purple object. Trapped in the core, there was only one place I could put it. So I brought it up to the altar on the ceiling and placed it there. Bam! The core activated, and we got the Silva Awakened Achievement, as the altar on the core opened up, revealing Pearl in its place. I did it! We only needed one quartz! When we went to take a closer look, it showed all the teleporters we had activated around the planet lit up. Clicking on one revealed why it was called a teleporter, warping us to any of the six teleporters we had activated. Five, Where the fuck did you go? I wanna go there. We can teleport around the world now. Even though we can now just teleport right back up to base, the same cannot be said about our rover. We were left with no t choice but to figure out how to drive the rover back out of the core. I'll just let the clips play for themselves, as I don't think there's anything I could say here that would show how terribly we did this. Uh, I'm on the trailer. <laughs> I can see that. I made it up the pillar. If you get out now, I'll go flying. It'd be really funny. We just need to... Don't go so far. I'm not even. I'm not even touching my keyboard, man. Maybe you should take more responsibility for your actions. All right, here's the cable. Reach the range of the cable, and we can take the trailer Dude, back. This gravity is impossible to deal. No, that will flip your gravity if you touch that. Don't touch I that. I know. Relax. It's kind of hard to turn in the gravity though. You have to go really, really slow because the torque is causing you to lift off. Dreamer block. There's. Oh my god. Seven what in. I didn't do anything. That was you. <laughs> True, that, that was me. There, you got it, you got it, you got it. Let's get out of here. Just drive up this pillar now. Wait, am I trying uh, Do I have- I have control. How the fuck do you got drink it? I don't know! Uh, I have a tunnel up. We have to find that. Otherwise, it will be the most miserable experience ever. <laughs> Wait, how do we get off the gravity? Go! 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 I'm in the wall. No, no, oh, seven, oh, seven, <laughs> it's getting sucked back. Uh, uh, ah. No, you're a Chad. We you're got so out. Cool. What am I stuck on? Now we got to do some scouting. We have to find where the exit is. I like how I could have been making a path to you, but I just haven't been. <laughs> Terrible teammate alert. What is this disgusting mess you made? I didn't make any messes either. Why is it so hard to make paths? Now I know there's an exit somewhere along these roads around here. I just don't know where exactly. Trust me, it took me like 30 minutes to dig up. You do not want to dig up with this thing. We just have to look for a paved path. Well, I don't know where I'm supposed to be looking. The paved path. Well, it's clear. Is it this over here? You found a way up? We'll follow it. Does it lead up? I hope so. I can't tell if this is the first or the second hole I made. I made two holes down here. I guess three now. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, there's some false holes. Why did, you, why did you make false holes? Because I was trying to find the way up. I got trapped down here for hours, bro. I'm Back to lost. the rover now. All right, I don't trust you in turning this thing. I'm gonna be real. What are you doing? Reversing. Dude, you do not know how to drive. What the fuck are you doing? I'm driving in like negative G's, bro. Give me a break. Attempting to drive in negative G's. It doesn't get any traction. You went the wrong way. Seven it, why is it doing this? Oh, I don't know. Maybe the person driving it is at fault. Are you stuck? Yeah, it's stuck. Oh. The path is above us now. We found the right path, but I can't get back onto it. Where was it? 
Alright, get out of the rover for a little. I'm gonna have to go up, and it's gonna be a lot of getting out and getting in. This is how you go up in the rover. You do that, and then you come here and you manually build a little pocket, and then you go up, and then you build another, another thing, and then you have to come back and manually build a bump. Where are we even going? Back to the <laughs> path. It's not this way though. It is! We never went on a small path. The small path is the one we built, do you not remember? Oh my gosh, you can't break! You can't break! Like, actually, you can't reverse oh, in the rover. The block? It won't let me turn! I'm holding the button and it won't turn! <laughs> I'm actually crying right now. Get in the rover and turn it! It won't turn! <laughs> You're gonna drive it off the edge, I know it. No, because I know how to drive. We're back to where we started. Well, why are we going there? Don't turn this way, we gotta go the other way. Then why did you turn this way? Oh my god. <laughs> so, we passed our turn, because you turned right instead of left. Why did we go down this path? Because this was the only way to get back up. After we fell. You could've just done a U-turn. You know, since you're complaining about driving, why don't you drive us to the hole? I don't even know where I'm going anymore, because I lost the way. Oh, shit! What way was it? I actually forgot now. I was laughing too hard at you, because... See? You are just as bad! No, because I... Because you went the wrong way the first time. I went the wrong way after I went the right way, I just fell! <laughs> Alright, this medium generator we've seen several times before. <laughs> Okay, okay, we need to do more, a little more reconnaissance again. It's this way, I'm pretty sure. Okay, why didn't we go just go this way the first time, then? We turn this way, and then this should be the astronium. It is, okay, let's drive this way. <laughs> Maybe if you didn't flip around your camera whenever you entered the vehicle. Hi, right, so it's this way, right? <laughs> yes, it's this way. All right, straight down. <laughs> oh my gosh, this vehicle. Okay, okay, let me try It won't back. let me I, turn. I'm let driving me off up. the cliff. Let me back up. Let me, let me back up. Let me back up. I can back up. Alright, I got it over. We're good. Alright, you can drive again. This is the Astronium Auto Mine. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Which way was it from here? Oh my god. Uh, I don't even remember anymore. Ah! Don't hit the Astronium Auto Mine. <laughs> that oh. was the exact opposite of what I said. <laughs> oh. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Uh, to quote you, I'm not even touching my keyboard. Okay, yeah, you just gotta go straight. You cannot fail anymore, alright? It's impossible to fail. If you fail, I'm gonna laugh at you. It is quite literally impossible to fail here. Except for the fact that we are on the most uneven terrain in existence. E yeah, even with it, it's impossible to fail. Wait, are we oh, in? Oh, oh, We're in! Good. And that was still a less painful oh, process than going good. up. Yeah, this is my second tunnel I made. I dare you to try to find that first tunnel. We're here, um, seven in. Upon returning, I started work on a railway network down to the core of the planet. I never wanted to drive back down there again. With a train network, I could bring power to the core. Along the train network, I would place astronium auto miners that I could stop by with a train full of empty canisters and swap them out for the miner's full one. No rover, no steering, perfect. On the other hand though, more scrap was needed to build the network of trains, and since we were still using soil for scrap, I would have to use the rover. I still couldn't figure out how to control the up and down on the rover's drill though. If I could figure this out, then gathering soil would become super easy. I decided I would figure out no matter what. No matter how long it took, I would do it. I read all the controls, no luck. I tried random mud puts while drilling, no luck. I scoured the internet and read it. Somehow, still no answer. There was only one last place to look, YouTube. I watched every Ashenir video that used the rover in it, and they all seemed to be going up and down fine. How was it done? That's when I found something weird when I was driving. The way they were moving, their camera, it seemed to mean something. Wait a second. It was the way you look. If you look down, then you would go down. But because I had always looked up because looking down clipped my camera into the car, I had never knew that this would do anything. Ah. Well, 
I could strip mine for some dirt now with the rover and get all the scrap I would need, the aluminum in the mining track. I filled up the back of the train with all the items I would need to set up the auto mining and wrote it down into the core. Once in the core, I built a path for the train to go to all the closest estronium veins lying around and placed the auto mining equipment down. Once back at base, it was time to make use of all the estronium that I'd be getting. It was time to make the ultimate scrap farm, the astronium scrap farm. By training astronium into solid fuel jump jets and feeding them into an extra large scrapper, the insane 1 to 3 astronium scrap ratio could be achieved. I made the platforms and the auto arms and laid down everything. The only problem with the farm was that I had to manually launch the trading rockets. Otherwise, they would drop all of their items onto the floor. This wouldn't stay a problem forever though, as as soon as we entered the automation age, I would figure out an upgrade for it. But for now, the astronia would give me a massive boost to my scrap production. With all the scrap that I could ever ask for, it was time to make the ultimate farm. Automatic nanocarbon alloy. The hardest resource to get in the entire game. I wouldn't make this just any nanocarbon alloy farm though. Unlike the ones you see on YouTube that you would supply with the base resources and it would combine them to make the nanocarbon alloy, this one would only need scrap. Using complex automation, it would automatically count the scrap out and trade them based off of the proper ratios for the recipe. There were five items that would be traded for with scrap. I'll show you the Microsoft Paint that I used to calculate the ratios and crafters I would need to build this beast. The only thing that wouldn't be made using scrap is the hydrogen and nitrogen that I would collect on the planet for free. And helium and argon would need it to be brought from off planet because it can't be made on Sylvie. But I could store them in a bunch of gas canisters and rarely need to replace them. Here's how the system would work. Storage sensors can detect when a storage is full and when it's empty. This would send two signals to a count repeater set to double the ratio of scrap I needed. Once the count has been reached. For example, on organics, it was two scrap. A delayed signal would be sent to the trader and it would be launched off. The next arm would then be turned on and it would collect its fair share of scrap. In the end, the circular pattern of arms turning on and off looked amazing and I'm glad I made it look like that. Once all the base resources were in one place, making the final product was as simple as lining up the crafters in the right order. Ammonium goes with the hydrogen to make hydrazine. That combines with graphite to make graphene. That's then combined with titanium to make titanium alloy. On the other side, iron and carbon are combined with argon to make steel, and then it's combined with the titanium alloy under helium gas, finally making the final product of nanocarbon alloy. In total, this project took me around five hours to complete, if you include the resource gathering and bug fixing. I had to slow down the input so that the traders could keep up, but in the end, the farm can make one nanocarbon alloy for every 45 seconds completely free from user interaction. With this much nanocarbon alloy, RTGs became rather cheap, and so did large resource canisters. There was also another thing in the future that would require 140 nanocarbon alloy, making me very glad I decided to build this farm. If you ever decide to play Astroneer, I would highly recommend trying to build a farm like this, as working with its automation system was actually pretty fun. I also had a lot of fun planning out the big mega farm, using all the, the Google Paint and just writing it down. It was a very fun process, and I'd recommend it. See if my big factory works. Scrap to nanocarbon alloy will commence and right after I duplicate the save. Making use of all the nanocarbon alloy that we now had, I went down to the astronium mines and upgraded all of their resource canisters to the large version, able to store 400 astronium compared to the 32 the medium ones could hold. The farm brought a new problem though. Since the start of the base, there hasn't been any problems with power since infinite solar was very powerful. However, every auto arm takes one use of power just sitting there and auto miners take eight use of power to mine. The base was starting to struggle on power, so I used the power of the nanocarbon alloy to make some RTGs and postponed having to make a more permanent solution. For now though, I'd spent so much time on the nanocarbon alloy farm, seven it was back, so it was time to go achievement hunting again. It's okay. okay. Well, got, yeah, I, okay and yes are literally synonyms in English, okay? Tell me one time where they mean something Not different. That. Okay, you can insult me all you want. Also, don't ask why someone is speaking in Japanese Google Translate. But before we go achievement hunting again, it had been a while since Seven had seen the base and all of the new farms we built he hasn't seen before. So I'll be giving him an in-depth tour of the base so anyone that wants to see a closer look to the farms and hear my live explanation on how they works, you can view that. Otherwise, you can skip forward in the video to when we start moving on. I'll put a timestamp here. This right here produces a, a ridiculous, ridiculous amount of scrap from Astronium. It takes the Astronium, turns it into solid fuel jump jets, and then that gets turned into scrap, which I also forgot to disable the output on this and something bad could have happened. And then this right here is, of course, you already know, this was the dirt to scrap farm. So this takes uh, dirt, turns it into resin, 
then uses that resin and turns it into small canisters and then the small canisters are then able to be used in the process of making scrap and we got a bunch of scrap here this over here of course is the where i trade scrap to resources so you just put a canister of scrap there which there is and then you can select the resources from the trading platform this right here is the crazy super smelter we have now behold it's able to smelt four items at once i'm making you a portable oxygenator bam qrtg uh -huh. this is the great farm that I've been working on. Right here, all you input is scrap. And remember, you can make scrap from Astronia or you can make scrap from dirt. It is that cheap. And if you just set it on the platform, then it will automatically craft a uh, nanocarbon alloy. All uh, right, I'm gonna show you how this works now because it's very cool looking when it does. All right, come over here, Seven. Come watch this. It is so cool. But if you watch, it's distributing the scrap automatically along all the rockets and then launching them. So over here, it's launching organics and it, it auto distributes based off of the distribution needed for crafting the recipe. I did the math myself on zero hours of sleep. I'm surprised it worked. Then this smelts carbon out of the organic. This smelts uh, iron and then over here with the argon that I have to get from another planet. It creates steel. Uh, I have it auto collected from another planet but you cannot automatically bring it over here. It's a gas that you have to collect on Glacia. I like it. And then this is the nanocarbon alloy. So right now we're seeing the iron rocket just landed from its distribution of scrap. Just be careful around the arms. They'll try to pass you helium or something. So here's the iron being smelted, popping into the steel section. And then you can see it's starting to make steel. The helium also has to be brought from another planet, but the rest can be done here. All right, there's the steel. And it's going into here with the helium and the titanium alloy and the titanium alloy is the other thing being made nitrogen and hydrogen are being made from atmospheric condensers here and then they are put into a chemistry lab that is getting its distribution of ammonium from the scrap and then that is turned into hydrazine which i need to create a separate system just for hydrazine because you know it's used for rockets hoverboards jump packs there's a lot of cool stuff you can make with it uh yeah it goes into here with the titanium creates titanium alloy and then it makes infinite nanocarbon alloy, which we can use to make a really cool storage system. But right now it's quest time. And for quest time, there's a lot of cool stuff we can do. To make exploration easier, we crafted some hydralazine thrusters out of titanium alloy, granting us the power to fly. All right, uh, since you're a toddler, I'll give you a rocket propelled jetpack. Nothing goes wrong when you give toddlers rocket propelled jetpacks, right? <laughs> do you like it? Flying also had the benefit of getting rid of movement penalties while carrying objects, letting us fly with the shuttle. We put this to use on Glacio as we went to activate the teleporters. Instead of using a rover to drive to all the teleporters and activating them, it was much faster to carry all the items in the shuttle and fly to the closest landing spot to a teleporter. All that was left was to cruise with our jetpacks and place down the power producing items at the teleporter. The plan was great and we packed up a bunch of small platforms and RTGs ready to power the teleporters, but when we got there, the plan fell apart. The three RTGs didn't even make a third of the power. Turns out, each planet takes a different amount of power to activate their teleporters. Alright, Seven, it's time to pack up ship. Uh, we failed this time, but we'll be back with a better plan. Now that I've read the wiki. So, we had to fly all the way back, get larger platforms, and make medium generators. Then, we could fly back to Glacio and try again. Three medium generators did the trick, and all they needed to run was some carbon, which we filled the rocket with. All that was left was to activate all the teleporters and head to the core. And yes, this takes longer than it looks. One core source later, and we were at the core. This time, I came prepared with the diamond needed to activate the core, and since there was no rover needing up, we could just teleport easily back to our shuttle at the southern gas farm.
Getting the Glacio Awakens achievement also got me my new favorite suit cosmetic, making me look like a little marshmallow dude that waddles like a penguin. To end off the day, Sevenet and I took a shuttle over to an unidentified satellite that was now orbiting the sun. We landed and found eight altars, just like the ones we had seen in the core, and there was a teleporter orb next to them that allowed us to teleport to the planet's core. This meant that any planet that we finished all the teleporters on, we could teleport to without having to use a shuttle. And it also looked like if we could bring the eight core fragments from each of the planet's core, we could activate something on the satellite. We would have to finish all the planet's core though to figure it out. There was now a plan. While Sevenet was gone, I prepared the shuttle for a trip to all the teleporters. Instead of making six platforms for every planet and being forced to leave them behind, I used Astronium to trade for packagers, an item that does, as the name suggests, and repackages the items back to when you first printed them. With these and the generators, every planet's teleporter can now be completed from the back of our shuttle. Since Sevenet was going to be gone all of today, I decided that I would automate the last resource I would need a lot of in this game, Hydrazine. It was needed to launch the shuttle and when we wanted to fly with our thrusters. For this setup, I wanted to launch a full shuttle of scrap for one of ammonia. This worked out great because instead of having to count all of the resources coming in, I could just have the arms fill up an 8 item storage, then toggle the scrap collection arm off and the loading arm on. Then, once the storage is empty, a signal would be sent to count repeater to launch the rocket. Having two factories now was starting to put a strain on power though, so I decided to build our late game power solution, the Solar Array. One of these produces a whopping 14 U's of power and could use the infinite sun energy of the southern pole. Just getting two of these down completely fixed power for most of the game, and all I would need to do is place down another if power ever became a problem. With the power upgrade now, I thought it would be a good time to use my knowledge of automatic trading to make my final upgrade to our farms. Do you remember how I have to manually activate the traders in the astronium to scrap farm? Well, I plan to change that. If I fill up a four storage, then I can get four astronium into the trader and then launch it, just like the hydrazine farm. Sadly, while the hydrazine farm uses an 8 to 8 ratio, the astronium one uses a 4 to 8. This might not seem like a problem until you realize that the trading rocket would be fired after only four of the items have been removed. This would have the other four items just fall on the ground. The only solution that I can come up with to fix this was to count the astronium in and count the items out. This turned my simple 20 minute upgrade into an hour long mess of wires and bug fixing. In the end though, the farm had worked. We now had a farm for everything we could possibly need in the game, and it was now time to just focus on a achievements. Collecting some sulfur from Atriox and making explosive power got the achievement for condensing every type of gas and synthesizing every type of resource in the chemistry lab. Grabbing a boatload of hydrazine, we now headed off on our great planetary teleporter activation. Starting with Desolato, Silva's moon, we got the two teleporters on the surface activated and surfed straight into the core. Coming prepared beforehand, I put the two zinc needed to activate the core and take home an extra core fragment for the satellite. We got the Desolato awakened achievement and new cosmetics unlocked. We then made our way over to Vanessa, the forest planet. Yo, that's a part of his landing spot. I am not putting that in the video. Sadly, because it was not a moon though, there were six teleporters, just like a full planet, and we had to activate them all. So we had to resort to telling stories to pass the time. Now we get to do story time while we're waiting for this. Are you bleeding? No. All right, pack up time. Let's go. Pack it up. All right, I get platform, you get generators. Let's go. All right, seven and story time. Once upon a time, there was a man who looked like a submarine. He was a billionaire. Oh, that's then cool. All right, pack it up, pack it up, pack it up. Eh. Let me, oh. One time, there's a fish called the Sucker Bam Bass Piss Piss Piss. Sucker Sucker Bam Bam Boss Piss Piss. You know you got that stuck in my head again. Alright, story time, story time. Fun time, this is dude, Jingle, who worked for this company, who exploited it. Yeah. Go, 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 go. Profit margins, profit margins. Okay, Dream Blog, story time. What, what's your story? Alright, so there was once this man, his name was Sevenant, and yeah. he was a Canadian. Damn! And then he decided he wanted to go to space, so he joined the Astroneer Space Program. And now, we're activating old alien technologies. Go, 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 go! It has started to become a routine now. Get in, place the gens, and turn them on. Wait to charge, then pack it up and rush out. Once all of the six teleporters were switched on, it was core dive in time again. Plug in the two graphene, and get the cosmetics with the Vanessa Awakened Achievement. Well, 
while we were mining, we also got an achievement for mining every resource in the entire game. After a quick hydrolyzine refill on Silva, it was time to complete Kalidor. The desert planet didn't provide any problems as we went from TP to TP lightning fast. Platform, gen, carbon, repeat. With all teleporters complete, it was once again core time. Get to the core, put in the item. Wait a second, where's the item? Climb back up to the shuttle and remember to grab the core items, then activate the core and get Kalidor Awakens achievement. There are only two planets left for us now. With one being a moon, we decided to save the easiest for last and head to Aatrox, the deadliest planet. Last time we went there, Seven and blew up our shuttle. Aatrox was not to be underestimated. With our jetpacks though, the plants on the surface shouldn't pose a problem as we can just fly right over them. Even though we gritted our teeth the entire time, nothing happened and we got all the teleporters on and I started to forget why Aatrox is the worst planet. When we went into the core however, Aatrox finally showed its true hand. Seven it was glitched into a wall and killed by a plant while I slid straight into a plant that one tapped me. Aatrox would not make anything easy for us. We tried our best to get our stuff back, but without oxygenators, there was nothing that could be done. Thankfully, I was able to get one of Seven Int's oxygenators and his QRTGs, but the rest of the stuff had clipped out of bounds. Having no choice but to turn back and get new stuff, we vowed to come back to Atriox and conquer it again. One resupply later, and we were ready to try and get to the core again. This time, I would take it way slower, as the crazy one-tap plant would kill me again if I decided to go fast, so I sneaked carefully by it and made it to the core. In the core, we found a lot of our lost items just chilling down there, showing how bad the physics are in this game. Atriox awakened achievement later, we teleported back up to the shuttle and reprinted Seven in a chair. Don't ask where the other one went. We then rocketed over to the last planet. The moon of Vanessa, Novus. Yes, I called it a planet, but it's I, the planets and moons are very similar in this game. The only difference is the moon only has two teleporters, so Novus was over in a flash. And putting the purple item into the core altar, we got our flood of achievements. Even though we had activated all of the teleporters and all the cores, there was still one last thing we could do with the core fragment. Remember the altars on the unidentified satellite? Well, we brought them all there and matched them with the right core fragment. This activated the ancient technology, opening a gateway into the beyond. The space station that had originally dropped us down lost track of us as we entered it, and our character was officially gone. We had escaped somewhere, nowhere though that we knew. The shuttle, unable to identify our life force anymore, put down another clone of us. And the and beyond achievement was completed and the cool drip was acquired, but the game was still not over. Each planet had some more stuff to do on it. Probe scanners could be followed and find an old wreck probe on each planet. There were also snails that could be found on every planet, requiring us to scan five of their shells, then make them a terrarium to live in. We then would bring the terrarium over to the planet and dance until we could capture it. You had already seen us do the beginning of this quest in the old world when we captured the Sylvie snail, Sylvia. The teleporter network we now had would make 
getting to all of the planets really easy to do these quests. To start off, you already saw how we got the Silva snail, as its shells were just lying in the forest. Each snail has a different effect for feeding it, and the Sylvie one lights up. We followed the probe scanner into the mountains and found the crash probe it was leading us to, getting us some new wanderer drip. Next up on our list was Kalidor. We captured Stilligard, who produced oxygen when fed. It would have been a great early game oxygenator, but now we would never need it since we were already super late game. We then went and found the probe, and it was the Hubble Space Telescope lying in the desert. Scanning it unlocked another Wanderer's Kemetic and knocked another probe off the checklist. After Kalidor, we headed over to Desolado and scanned the shells needed right off of the surface of the planet. When we were making the terrarium for Desolado, we needed dagger root seeds, and Savinant swore that it had to be found at Sylvie's core, so we rode the train all the way down, even though we were running out of power and it was super slow, and then we took it all the way back up, just to find out that dagger root was on the surface of Desolado all along. Sometimes, the wiki can only slow you down. Once we filled up the terrarium and took it on the Desolado, we captured Usagai. I definitely butchered that name, but it basically does practically nothing, so I don't feel bad. It still brought us closer to our goal of collecting all the snails, though. The probe on Desolado was the New Horizons probe, unlocking Wanderer Yellow. Next on the planetary chopping block was Vanessa and Novus. Seven, it would gather the shells from Vanessa while I gathered the ones from Novus. Novus shells were found in clumps of brown mud that definitely didn't take a wiki search to figure out, and Seven, it got his shells easily. Upon returning to make the terrariums, we got the final seed needed for the Ashenir's Garden achievement. Vanessa would be up first for its snail. It was Princess, and it was by far the most OP one. When fed, Princess would provide immunity to all damage in the entire game except for suffocation, but we were already a immune to that with our oxygenators. We went from not having any armor in the entire game to being completely invincible. Compared to the snail, the probe wasn't anything abnormal, and we got the Voyager 2 probe complete. However, on Novus, the snail would give us the slip, as it seemed to disappear in the middle of us capturing it. Turns out, it decided to climb all the way up the teleport building and play some hide and seek with us. Rogel, the rascal that he was, was just an extra powerful QRTG. He must have had dreams of being turbo or something. The probe of Novus turned out to be Mariner X, and it would have just been any normal probe in our probe collection journey if it hadn't been for the cosmetic that it gave me. Black and red. Oh, Wanderer Red! See, black and red was the color of my very first laptop I ever got, so in my mind, it's always been an amazing color combination. I'd been seeing that the other Wanderer combinations were some kind of black and another combo of a color, and I'd been hoping that there'd be red. Novus would fill that dream for me. After doing all of that, Seven it had to go. Yes, we did all of the teleporters and a bunch of snails in a single day. It was a very long Astroneer day, though I wouldn't be getting off yet. There was still a bunch of random missions that had to be done, like print a tractor or landing a platform on every planet. And to say 100% of the game, I wanted to make sure that my mission log was complete, even if they weren't achievement. So I set out to do all the random quests while Seven it was gone. I would bring an exo chip over to Glacier, medium wind turbine there, and once once I had done a bunch of random tasks, I restocked the helium and argon in the nanocarbon farm and just waited because I still needed the 140 nanocarbon alloy. With all the minor quests done, it was time to go back to achievement hunting. Glacio and Atriox were the last planets that we needed to do the snail and probe treatment. To get the shells from Glacio, we came packing with explosives and demolished the ice chunks from underground to unfreeze the snail shells. On Atriox, the shells were a little more dangerous to get, just like everything on Atriox. The shells had to be dug up from under the one tap plants that killed us when we were trying to go to the core. With some keen eyesight and careful digging, we managed to pick up all the shells we needed without getting killed by a single plant. Thankfully, no more RPG disasters. I count this as a win. Me, one, Atriox, two. With the shells gathered, we can now make the final two terrariums and set out to catch them all. Atriox was first with Inoki, who gives increased run speed and jump speed when fed. That speed let Sevenant reach the probe way before me, and he had to wait for me to fly all the way over there and scan Atriox probe. Sputnik satellite. One scan later, and the Wanderer Green achievement, we made our way over to Glacio, the last planet for both the probes and the snails. With the dance for Glacio Snail Beastafar, the final planet had been danced on for the Galactic Boogaloo achievement. Beastafar would act as an upgrade to the terrain tool, but I wouldn't really use it because feeding it all the time for a slight increase was just not worth it. Plus, we had the rover for collecting soil. Glacio also had the final probe, Pioneer 1 spacecraft, unlocking some memories from the past and allowing a friend to be Scene. The Wanderer peeked his head through the dimensional gap and waved goodbye, gifting us the glorious cosmetics and, of course, the Wanderer's Way achievement. Back on Silva, all the snails could be brought back for one final scene at the wrecked ship that they were originally brought on. Uh, we just got 
Ice Snail, then Atriox Snail, then uh, Nova Snail, Rogel, Kalidor, Desolata, and Sylvie. <laughs> They're singing! This finished up the two quest lines, only leaving us with three left until the whole game had been completed. For now though, I decided to keep the achievements rolling and strap two thrusters onto the back of a rover and turn them on. Now, this may seem crazy, but where we're going, we ain't need no roads. Let's go, Seven It! Where we're going, we need no roads! And that's also the name of the achievement. Ah! <laughs> Seven it! <laughs> no, we actually left the atmosphere. There's no gravity. I'm trying to go to Desolato. I have no control. That's the space shuttle that we came off. Of. Oh, we're falling back down, Seven it! We never left the planet. I'm in orbit. Wait, we've actually launched the car into orbit. Oh no! Oh no! I'm crashing back down. On Glacio? We're on Glacio! <laughs> we flew off the planet! With a hard crash landing on Glacio, I think it's safe to say we broke our way out of the planetary orbit. Seven, it took the landing a little bit too hard when he jumped out of the vehicle and straight into the ground, requiring me to shuttle his items all over to his clone. With the big planetary road trip over, it was now time to upgrade our tech. According to my sources, <clears throat> the quest log, Desolato and Vanessa contained highly valuable schematics locked in containers. All we had to do was free this data through literal use of explosives and follow the coordinates inside like a treasure map to Matt. Matt, or Material Analyst Transmitter, would provide us with blueprints if we brought it the resources it needed. Now, if to my MMO players out there that sounded like a fetch quest, then you'd be absolutely right. Matt wanted two zinc, two copper, two plastic, and two aluminum. All easy items to get, but not on Desolato. So, after me and Seven it went back to Silva and brought all the requested items back to Desolato, we shoved them into Matt until he was absolutely full. He was so full he popped. Back away! Mission abortion. W. Abortion. Thank you, Matt, for your sacrifice and giving us the best vehicle in the game, the hoverboard. The hoverboard is amazing. Combine low friction surfboards with a hydrazine jetpack and you go extremely fast. There's no other way to describe it, but cool and smooth. Teleporting over to Vanessa, I weaved my ways through the trees and rigged the vehicle crash to explode. I then followed it over to Vanessa's Matt, who turned out to be the greedy brother of the generous Desolato Matt. He wanted so many resources, I'm not even gonna name them. I'll just show you the wiki page. I forgot to record it, but I brought over all the resources and the greedy mat exploded, giving us the VLT blueprints. Unlike the hoverboard though, the VLT was just a slower rover that can fly. Cool, but with our jetpacks, there was no need for a flying car. What we did need was vehicles for our next quest on Glacio though. It was time to channel our inner conductor and start a cargo line. Shipping crates were found all over the surface of Glacio, and frozen Archon was found in the caves. Both of them needed to be shipped on over to the Glacio train station that we had set up and with no one else on the planet it was our job to do it now while other quests to this point have been grindy like act 
activating all the teleporters, none have felt as grindy as this. The idea behind building a railway to resources and bringing them back to a station is pretty cool, but the reality was way too far off from that, as just bringing the resources to the train station without using the train was a much better use of your time. Without the hoverboard graced upon us by the Desolato mat, bringing the 10 crates and 20 argon would have been insanely painful. Because the hoverboard got rid of most of the carrying movement speed penalty though, we could fly along with the items faster than we could ever put them on a train. That better be it. I swear if there's another quest, I'm gonna be pissed. New mission! This would not be the end of the train loading simulator, as completing the quest on Glacio had us repeat it on an entire new planet, Kalidor. The difference with Kalidor, though, was that the location of the items needing to be fetched were farther away. We needed 10 obelisk fragments that had to be brought up all the way from the core after we blew them up with TNT, and 7 it had to grab some artifacts from deep within the cavern layer. In order to dig these items out, we had to dig giant tunnels straight into the ground and fly them up with our jetpacks. Building a train would have just taken a lot of time to get just a little bit of resources since they were all spread out from each other. So me and Seven Inch split up, I getting the obelisk fragments and he getting the artifacts. I know I'm making this sound terrible, but it took us two hours of just grabbing items to complete these quests. And you had to do this quest line for the final quest of the game. If I were to do this again, I would not attempt to do it all in one day because it was just so boring and it would have been terrible if I hadn't had Seven Inch with me. I'll be back. It's another fetch quest. Look at the mission log, bro. Who thought it would be fun to do this? Maybe building it with a train would have actually been fun, but it would have taken so much longer as well. With Kalidor done, it was time to move on to the final planet. Another planet, but at least it's the last one. This time, we'd be on Silva. Thanks to Silva being where the main base is, we already had a train line down, making it very easy to ride up and down and grab all of the mushrooms it asked for. And the secondary item was just Astronium, and you already know how much Astronium we have in this game. So while you watch me and Sevenant grab the mushrooms, let's talk story. See, up to this point, not a lot of quests have had a lot of story in them, or the story's just been very vague and not completely explicit. These later quests, though, actually start to have some story in them. I had created my own story with the beginning of this script, talking about aliens, the predecessors, and the corporation. Somehow, even though I had started this script before even finishing the game, I hit the story pretty spot on, only missing a big twist at the end. I'll be summarizing the train storyline right now, but if you want to read the full thing, all of it's just done in text logs. The train quests follow the message logs between the two predecessors, Conductor Bell and Dr. Stone. They are attempting to establish rail networks over the planets and extract their resources for studying. Dr. Stone, the hothead he is, decides to tinker with all of Bell's gear and screw it all up. In the end, Bell ends up doing all the work and, from the sound of it, would never want to work with Dr. Stone again. In the end, it seems they discovered something weird and an accident happened, forcing them off of the planet. It confirmed the existence of the predecessors and gave a reason on why they may have left. The message logs were cool though, especially considering how much I hated this quest line's actual gimmick. They ended up being the highlight of my least favorite mission so far. And in the time I was telling you the story, we got all of the mushrooms up and completed the Great Rail quest line. As always with Astroneer, completing a quest gets a cool cosmetic drop. We get the conductor suit and the conductor whistle emote. That was the only emote that I thought was good enough to talk about and to tell you that there's actually emotes in this game. Other than of course, the moonwalk, which I've been doing for every single snail quest. For this second to last quest, I thought it'd be cool to slap on the conductor suit because I'm going to be shipping away all of our nanocarbon alloy. If you remember the 141 nanocarbon alloy that I've been hinting we've been needing this entire game, well then, I congratulate you because we're finally going to be using it. During the entire time we've been playing Astroneer, there's been an event going on called the Automated Mass Protocol, where you get to ship off a bunch of items and get rewards and cosmetics for doing so. Once you have reached 1920 points, you can get the final event cosmetic. Since I didn't even want to figure out how I'd be shipping 2000 compound, using nanocarbon alloy at 15 points apiece was the most logical way to complete it. With all of the nanocarbon alloy gone, the cosmetic achieved looking like the loader from the 
Risk of Rain 2, and the event quest complete, it was now time for the final quest. Now, buckle up, because this final quest is finally going to give us the entire story of the entire game. Going into our quest log, we get to see a quest called Help, and we can click the green button to finally start it. The quest gives us a new item called a Fault Finder, where after we carry it around and complete a little mini game, it lights up and we're able to bring out an actually talking snail called Eva. Eva tells us to talk to them using our mission log. Very fourth wall breaking, but not as fourth wall breaking as telling us that the whole world is a simulation. <clears throat> I don't know, why would that be a fourth wall breaking? <laughs> Well, the world of Astroneer is a broken simulation, and the only way to fix it is to fly into the sun. Now, if anyone told me to jump into the sun in real life, I would either think that they're crazy or a Valorant player. But we do have a clone bay, and they were kind enough to provide us with a rocket. As I glided into the sun, somehow, it didn't lead to our immediate deaths. But there was a control room of the simulation in there. Yo, what the fuck? The sun was an illusion all along? Still not gonna try it out IRL though. This is where all of the lore is done. It goes from 0 to 100 really quick. So, while Seven and I complete the quest in the background, I'll be spending the time to explain the lore. Oh, the bug is here. Not a bug, bro, it's a rat. <gasps> a rat? Oh my gosh, it's another Astroneer. We are a part of the Elysium's crew, a ship working under the Exo Corporation. We were tasked with aiding the Tritium, a ship that went missing in Space Frontier. In order to find out more, we were sent over to Novus to grab some fractal roses. On the way to Novus, somehow Sevenant falls out of the rocket mid-launch, and learns the hard way that there is no way off of the sun without a rocket. So, I have to fly back to pick up Sevenant. But, I forget a chair, so I have to fly back and get a chair, then fly back and get Sevenant. Then we can get the fractal roses we need to complete another fault finder and a lock more story. In our search for the Tritium, we found it, completely demolished far out in space. But it was not alone. Our ship was sabotaged from within by a crew member, possibly Dr. Stone, that had gone insane due to an onboard LRD. This left us stranded deep in space's frontier. In order to protect us, Kronos activated the Ashenir space training program. This kept all of our minds that were in mine bakes safe and alive. If you don't know what an LRD was, well, neither did I, and I only figured it out after reading the game's wiki. They are some kind of weird experimental marble with one called number 16 zebra able to control people's minds you can hear his whispers now on the elysium chronos was the only one to be placed in the control room of the simulation with all the other crew members stuck in separate instances so he was the only one that could save us with the limited power of the ship he created a system for astroneers to save themselves the thing he created was eva and the teleporters the teleporters were actually communication modules disguised as alien tech from novus that chronos used to entice the astroneers into activating them there was a lot of story in that chunk but to get the final bits we had to head to atriox and plant some flowers why this unlocks files is explained as them being keys to the simulation or something, but what works works. And all we needed to do was complete another fault finder. With the story told paid, it was now time to continue reading. Turns out, the Elysium crashing screwed up the simulation, changing all the planets in Silva system to be corrupted in some way. Aatrox lost its radiation, which I'm glad for. I don't think it needed to be any worse than it already was. Also, just a fun fact of the Ashtonir world, it seems that crew members don't actually have bodies, just mines stored in databases where they then get printed out to do whatever they need to do. So, an Ashtonir going to Aatrox would get a radiation-proof body printed off before landing there. That explains how the whole clone bay works and why no one could go fix the Elysium outside of the simulation since there were no actual bodies and the printer was broken. There was also other planets that were different, like Glacia was actually a hot and cold planet, and Kalandor really had a boatload of gold on it. Desolado was actually blown up in real life as well, which is funny considering what the Astroneer community does to Desolado. However, the simulation's instabilities also brought some bad news. As crew members' data were leaking out of their brains and mixing with the simulation, these people would never be able to leave the simulation again. And the probes we found earlier were from the Wanderer's memory. Eva showed us a photo that we took with the Wanderer, as it would be our last time seeing him, as he would never be able to leave. Kronos had become corrupted in the years he had been running the simulation. 
Now, with the final fault finder complete, we'd be able to figure out what his plan was and understand his full story. Turns out, Kronos had been with us all along, cheering for us and hoping for all of us to live. For as long as he could, he gave his everything into fixing the communication system on board the ship, as he knew it was the only way we would ever be saved. In our quest to 100% the game, we had unknowingly completed everything Kronos had left for us to save all the astroneers. In powering all the teleporters, we had fixed the communication system, and in completing all the quests, we had a reactivated Eva who knew how to use it. It was now time to activate the communication device and save us all. Kronos was a man who cared about all of us, and in his final breath, he used his own power to turn on the communication system. We had done it. We had sent out the SOS signal to the Exo Corporation and had secured rescue for all of the crew members stuck in the Astroneer training program. All that was left was for us to wait the years it would take for rescue to arrive. After all the work Kronos had done to save all of us, the only thing left behind of him was his crown. We donned his crown in memory of him and headed back to Silva to see the final gift he had left for us. Turns out, Eva had lived, and she had granted us the ability to fly. The only thing that was left now was to launch the fireworks and get the final achievement of the world. And of course, mine the one lithium that I hadn't done because I'd been putting off the quest for a long time. I launched the fireworks and, um, no achievement. Uh, how about launch it like this? Nope, still no achievement. Turns out you have to launch the fireworks in a very specific way, using the rover and your two widget slots on your backpack. Not a climactic way to end the world off, but we can pretend I got it first try and not 30 minutes later. With that, the world was done. In total, completing all achievements took me over 80 hours. To get the last achievement of them all, all I would have to do is join Seven its world and research one item. With that, I would get the golden cosmetic and achieve get every achievement in the game achievement. There would be nothing left to do. Seriously, thank you to anyone who managed to make it to the end of this video. This whole journey was the first time I'd ever managed to fully complete a game, and I'm so glad that I could take you all along with me. I hope you all enjoyed this as much as I enjoyed making it, and if you did, I'm planning to do more 100% in game videos in the future, so feel free to subscribe. For those who want my final opinion on Ashtonir, I'll give it now. Overall, I really liked Ashtonir. The graphics are unique, and the mechanisms for dealing with the terrain tool was cool. On the automation side of things, the logistics system was fun, and it was surprisingly deep for how simple it was. Also, any game with trained is a plus in my book. Having physics for all of the items and stuff in the game was fun, though oftentimes it led to more annoyance than it was joy, considering the amount of clipping my items did the entire time I played this. The questline in the game was pretty fun, though there wasn't really any story till the end of the game. Even then, I liked the story. The way it was presented with little mission logs and stuff was actually surprisingly done well. If you're looking for a fun, casual sandbox game to play with friends, then Astroneer would fit that perfectly. Overall, I give Astroneer out of 10. Thanks for watching. Did you even say a number?